Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome. So we have been uh, discussing uh, some of the statistical methods uh, applied to uh, discrimination studies. We uh, discussed uh, about primarily Fisher information and uh, minimum variance unbiased estimator um, uh, discussions and the relation between the um, I mean the minimum variance unbiased estimator and Fisher information which is the kramer rao bound. Uh, with that, we uh, discussed on fidelity of coding by neurons based on um, this Fisher information and it is a function of the stimulus and the Fisher information shows how the discrimination performance would be near that very value of S or the stimulus and that is if we change the S in a very small amount. Uh, then how well can we discriminate them. So, uh, as we had discussed in mutual information early on uh, and uh, in some other discussions, we were considering that the stimulus is not necessarily going to be that uh, uh, parametric and that there will be a very small difference, but there can be many different entities as we did for the confusion matrix. Now we will uh, take up an example where we will try to relate discrimination of two stimuli and uh, try to relate it to performance by a, a subject in that in this case it is a trained monkey that is doing the discrimination task and the neurons in its uh, cortical region that is thought to be involved in processing such stimuli, uh, the performance based on the neurons will be compared with the actual performance of the monkey and see how well it matches and uh, at the end there will we will have a small discussion about the uh, perturbation studies where more about the causality can be established. So, this is work by uh, uh, Britain et al. Uh, it is now about uh, um, it is now about uh, 30 years old 1992. Um, so, in this case the area of the brain that has been studied is the area called MT which is in the wear visual pathway. If you recollect uh, from the our early discussions on the different sensory systems, we had that uh, in the visual system after the initial uh, stages in the cortical region, uh, the visual pathway is divided into two parts, one that uh, processes what information and goes on to do object recognition and the other that goes on to uh, process the location or position information and uh, goes on to the uh, more on the dorsal side of um, um, dorsal side of the cortex. Now, this area MT is known to be this, the neurons in there are known to be direction selective. That is within the receptive fields of neurons. Um, that is if we have the somewhere the visual field uh, like this, if this represents the entire visual field, then uh, the, the actually the receptive fields are quite large and uh, if there is motion of a visual object in there, um, uh, then uh, the neurons here respond strongly to one particular direction and less strongly in the other directions with a 
minimal response or even suppressed response in the direction opposite to uh, its preferred direction. So, if we have object movement in the field of view along different directions, this theta varies from 0 to uh, 2 pi or 360 degrees, um, then um, if we plot the response rates, then this is our angle theta direction of motion and this is rate, then uh, neurons have a preferred direction that is uh, some theta naught to which the response rate is maximum and in the exactly opposite direction that is theta naught plus pi, it has sort of a minimal uh, response. Um, so, this is the opposite direction theta naught plus pi. In fact, there may not be responses and sometimes it may even dip below its spontaneous level. So, the, the, the we have now the uh, response characteristics of the neurons that um, we will be discussing that they are selective to direction of motion. Now, as we have said all along, these responses are stochastic in nature and generally follow a Poisson like distribution in terms of spike counts. So, the this curve that we have plotted this tuning to uh, movement direction that is based on average of many many repetitions. So, in general if I take uh, a particular direction be it the preferred direction which is theta naught, there is a large degree of variability in response large I mean it depends on the kind of neuron and so on. There is a variability around that region. So, that means the rates can be scattered around this region and the average is like this. So, now if we uh, take the, the um, and take the histogram of the rates at a particular direction, uh, then let us say this is rate and this is percentage of uh, trials. So, let us say if we present it 20, 30 or 50 or 100 times that uh, moving stimulus in, a, in that theta naught direction, then we can get different possible firing rates and uh, that may have a distribution which is something like this where this is our mean rate. Um, and this is being, so if this is the response distribution for the angle theta naught, this mean rate is what is being plotted here. So, this, this uh, rate mean rate is what is the mean rate here in the tuning curve. So, we have a spread around that mean rate. So, if uh, uh, we are tasked with the job of discriminating two different directions, then uh, we will let us say if it is a theta prime here, theta naught or let us say theta 1, these two, there is a distribution of rates around that also. And so, that rate may be here and there may be a distribution of uh, responses around it. So, as we have uh, seen though, so the, the task is then to um, make the decision about uh, whether the two stimuli are different or not uh, depends on the actual spread of these rates uh, for that neuron or the population of neurons. So, we will currently limit the discussion to a single neuron, but can easily be extended to population of neurons. So, Given this uh, 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 spread, uh, we can have an overlapping region and so, the obviously, the more separated with lesser spread these distributions are, uh, we will get better performance in terms of discriminating two different directions of motion. So, this, this here we are considering theta naught as the as a continuous sort of variable just as we discussed in Fisher information. 
in the example that we will talk about it will be about specific two directions only which is uh, the neurons preferred direction theta naught and the uh, the orthogonal uh, or sorry the opposite direction theta naught plus pi modulo uh, 2 pi. So, now uh, to uh, so since the uh, this is an experiment uh, with monkeys the task was uh, made in this manner to simulate direction of motion. a random dot pattern, a random dot pattern stimulus was used. So, what is this random dot pattern? So, in the receptive field of the neuron within that region, there are a number of dots at random positions within that region. And uh, so, the dots all can move in one particular direction all of them. So, that move as in the, the, the image or the video in every frame uh, is updated in this manner that is every 45 milliseconds. So, the image uh, that is shown here with the random dots are present for 45 milliseconds and immediately after that the there is an updated position of the dots which is a small movement in a particular direction. So, all of them shift in a particular direction. Uh, like this. So, the uh, new uh, pattern is by this and there may be some new dots coming in to the field of view. Um, or in the receptive field to have a continuity. So, if, if you can now imagine that in the next instant they move again in a, that same direction, uh, that would mean that uh, there is a motion in the field of view of the monkey and um, so this will clearly have the effect of a motion within the receptive field. And um, so, the first the direction tuning or rather the movement direction tuning of these neurons uh, are uh, obtained. So, we have the I am sorry, we have the theta naught and the theta naught plus pi uh, modulo 2 pi. Um, anyway, we can drop that modulo basically you understand that uh, preferred direction and the direction opposite to it. So, um, in, in, in this case when all the dots are moving in the same direction together, um, it is uh, and all the dots are moving in the opposite direction together, the monkey which has the task to discriminate these two can easily do the task. So, what we mean in this case is that when all the dots are moving in sync, uh, all dots uh, are moving in sync that is uh, every that is just as we talked about all of them are moving in the same direction uh, together um, that is what we call a 100 percent coherence stimulus, 100 percent coherence and the obviously the task is easy. Now, if we reduce the coherence that is the percentage of dots that will move in the same direction while the others move in a random direction. Uh, then as we reduce this uh, coherence to 30 to 20 and in fact to 1 and then to 0, which means the 0 case is that 
there is no direction of motion actually that is the dots are updated in totally random directions every time so theta naught and theta naught plus pi have no meaning uh, and so it is impossible uh, for the i mean impossible for the monkey in a two alternative force choice to do anything correctly so it will 50% uh, of the time it will be correct 50% of the time the monkey would be wrong in terms of detecting this uh, um, or, or discriminating the two directions uh, two directions in this case has actually uh, is a misnomer but it is two stimuli as if there could have been two directions so now if we look at the performance of the monkey for the different coherences so if this axis is the percentage coherence as we move to the right the task gets easy and to the left the task is difficult so as we said when the coherence is zero or extremely small let us say we will have this logarithmically let us say it is point uh, uh, zero 1 percent and uh, then we have a 0.1 percent then we have a 1 percent then we have a 10 percent um, and of course a 100 percent so this we are plotting logarithmically and this side is the percentage of times the monkey is correct in discriminating the two directions of uh, motion in its uh, which is shown in that field of view and the direction is set such that uh, the neuron that they are recording from that uh, that neurons best direction is theta naught and um, its opposite uh, direction. So, the performance would start out as we said at a 50 percent level that is um, the monkey uh, on average is basically randomly choosing one of the two and uh, over a long period of time it will all average out it is expected to average out to a percentage correct of 50 or 0.5. Um, so, if you are saying percentage let us correct this and make it um, 50 and of course when the monkey is performing perfectly that is 100 percent correct so what the result showed uh, that uh, that means that from uh, this end to the left to the right it is supposed to go up to 100 percent and uh, there would be a position where the monkey will start to discriminate the direction correctly in that is and perform above chance level at some intermediate level and reach some um, the half uh, of the correct uh, that is 75 percent or some other criteria 80 percent at some particular percentage of coherence. What is found is that essentially at uh, up to around 1 percent the monkey is unable to uh, detect uh, any, uh, any of the directions correctly and within this period from after right after 10 percent it starts to discriminate uh, perfectly. So, this function the percentage correct as a uh, function uh, as a function of percentage coherence this is the, the behavioral or psychometric function that is this is what the monkey is actually doing in terms of its behavior how well it is performing for the different coherence levels. So, now in order to um, actually um, perform um, the analysis we if we consider the um, responses at different coherences what is observed is that for a 100 percent coherence stimulus the rates in the direction of theta naught and uh, the opposite direction 
uh, theta naught plus pi. Um, these are the two stimuli. Um, uh, the distribution of resp uh, rates uh, in the theta naught case is quite high in the sense that uh, this is rate and this is fraction or percentage of trials. So, what, what are we plotting here? We are plotting a, a distribution estimated from uh, the response rates with multiple repetitions of the stimulus theta naught. So, let us say 20 or 50 or 100 whatever was used based on those uh, number of um, responses we have uh, as many firing rate values and from that we get this distribution. And similarly, uh, for the baseline not I mean so similarly for the theta naught plus pi case we will have another distribution which is going to be very well separated when this is 100 percent discrimination I uh, 100 percent coherence. So, this is for 100 percent coherence. Similarly, as we go to a 0 percent coherence, we will have a response distribution. The, the red one would be similar um, and in this case the green one would be also almost I mean basically the same. I am not overlapping them basically going to be the same because there is no uh, apparent direction of motion. And uh, for the other coherences, we will have intermediate sort of overlaps until the two get fully separated or I mean almost uh, largely separated. So, this is the same axis here and this is again the same axis right. So, now uh, based on these rates or uh, rate responses of neurons as so uh, assuming that our uh, response measure that is being used by the monkey to do this task is rate. We need to find out how uh, based on those rates uh, we, we ourselves can uh, or statistically we are able to do this discrimination and what is the percentage of times we would be uh, correct based on these neural responses. So, in that case, um, let us consider now there are two stimuli and um, that is we will consider the movement along theta naught as the plus stimulus and movement along the opposite direction as the minus stimulus. So, these are the two stimuli we have and let us say this is the case of correct and this is the case of incorrect. So, we essentially have something like the confusion matrix that we had discussed earlier and so and we will call this box here um, is the hit rate that is we will represent by the symbol beta. What we mean by that is uh, what is the probability of correct if the stimulus is a plus stimulus that is probability correct given plus. And, um, we will uh, call, um, that so obviously the probability of incorrect uh, is going to be 1 minus beta. That is, um, probability of incorrect given the plus stimulus. That is, um, now in when the stimulus given is minus, if uh, the probability of incorrect 
when the stimulus is minus that means the uh, we are saying based on the responses we are saying that there is a plus stimulus although there is a minus stimulus that is what we mean by incorrect with a minus stimulus and that is called the false alarm that is we are falsely uh, saying that the positive stimulus has occurred so this will be represented by alpha and obviously this is going to be 1 minus alpha given the uh, different stimuli now if we assume that these stimuli have equal likely equal probability of occurrence this is half and half will get a joint distribution by simply dividing each of these values by 2. So, this is going to be our beta which is hit and probability of incorrect given the minus stimulus is our alpha. So, uh, what are we basing our decisions on? That well, I mean, uh, the, we take the call that it is a plus stimulus based on the responses or we take the call it is a minus stimulus based on the responses. We have to define something called a threshold here and that threshold would be somewhere in between the overlapping region and we can call that Z. So, we have rate distribution here we will consider it continuous as we have always said the spike count uh, is discrete but if we randomize the uh, duration over which we are calculating the rate then uh, it also becomes a continuous distribution so so probability of correct given plus is beta is going to be a function of this threshold that is if we choose that threshold to be z if the rates are larger than z then we call that the stimulus is plus if we have rates that is less than z then we call the stimulus is minus so if this is our criteria for decision making then these betas and alphas are going to be a function of z depending on where I put this threshold. The threshold can be put here, the threshold may be put here um, depending on that. So, this is z, this is z and we can also then bring in the rate as random variable that is beta z is probability that our rate is greater than equal to z given a plus stimulus and similarly alpha z is going to be the probability that r is uh, greater than equal to z given a minus stimulus. So, this is hit and this is false alarm. So, we will uh, now see uh, how to analyze this is to use what we call the ROC curve or receiver operating characteristics. So, in that what we will see is basically a plot of our alpha um, and beta as a function of z alpha as a function of z. So, alpha and beta are going to be what we have said the hit and false alarm and so since they are probabilities they would range between 0 to 1 and here also 0 to 1 and for varying z we will have different kinds of performances or different kinds of alpha and z which is what we call the receiver operating characteristics analysis. So, we will stop here in this lecture and we will start off with analyzing the receiver operating characteristics uh, the ROC curve um, in the next lecture. Thank you.